We live in a death phobic society. I have destroyed this family. People don't want to talk about it. They don't think it will happen to them. It was so devastating to me. And that's when I became such an advocate. Everything that happens in our life is the journey to where we're supposed to go. You know, people don't like to talk about end of life because and I don't want to die, but I want to have a good plan. It takes courage because this is an emotional topic. And the sooner we start talking about it, the better it will be, the more peaceful it will be. Maureen Curis spent 35 years as an oncology, hospice, and ICU nurse. This specialized work has given Maureen a unique perspective on life and death. She has seen firsthand the devastation that can happen when families aren't prepared for the death of a loved one. So, she decided to devote herself full-time to helping families prepare more proactively and cope more positively with the transition of a loved one. Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks Podcast. Joining me today is Maureen Curis. Maureen, it is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here. So I want to jump right in. Given the current pandemic environment that we've been living in for nearly a year, mortality and death has become something very real for a lot of people. How would you describe our society's attitude toward death? We live in a death phobic society. Even with all the death and devastation that we've experienced in these last 10, 11 months, we still live in a death phobic society. People don't want to talk about it. They don't think it will happen to them. They just don't want to think about it happening to them. When it happens, when death strikes suddenly, people don't know how to cope because they've never talked about it or rarely talked about it or talked about it in general terms. What do you think is the hardest aspect of death that people have to deal with? I think the um, fear of the unknown. They fear what death will be like. They fear not having their family member with them anymore or their loved one, the person that matters most to them. But they fear a painful death. There's so many fears related to death. And most of it's because we don't talk about it. So what's unknown to us is fearful. What do you think are some of the main misconceptions that people have about death? I think one of the main misconceptions is that death is painful and it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes it is with lack of planning, lack of preparation, lack of proper comfort measures, but it doesn't have to be that way. I think that that is one thing that I hear a lot, that people are afraid of a painful death. What motivated you to become an end of life coach? I realized when I looked back, it's something that I've been doing for most of my adult life. I ended up as an oncology nurse, not by choice. It was the first job I could get out of nursing school. And I wanted to be a flight nurse. I did not want to be working with dying people, you know, and I just thought, oh gosh, I'm going to get out of here as fast as I can, get my year's experience. But I fell in love with the patients and their families and the journey. And I realized that I was good at helping people on this last journey of their life. And so through the years, I have always been an advocate for people getting their end of life planning done, especially for healthcare, you know, especially their documentation for who can make their legal decisions, because I saw the devastation when those documents weren't in place and no one had a legal voice for the person that could no longer have their legal voice. And through a chance conversation, chance post on Facebook, a comment I made, I have come down this path. I was encouraged to do this and I resisted at first. And then the signs from the universe that just, I should be doing it. And it became larger than life. Like I just, can't stop. 
I just want everyone to experience the peacefulness that can be theirs at the end of life. Can you give us an idea, maybe through some example of, a, of maybe a family that you saw that, that wasn't prepared and, and what that looked like in, in real terms? You know, I saw it both when I worked oncology and I was a bone marrow transplant nurse. I saw it there when they weren't prepared. But one of the things when you do have a chronic or life limiting illness, it gives you time when they aren't prepared. That's what I loved working in the ICU and I hated working in the ICU because that's where the devastation you see the people and gosh, one that just has stood out to me for 30 years. You know, I probably 25 years ago, I took care of her 62 year old woman. She was the picture of health. She had played tennis that morning and what took her mom to a 85 year old mother to a doctor's appointment and was driving her mother home when she slumped over the wheel of her car and they crashed into the bushes. This was in the early 1990s and, you know, before cell phones were in everyone's hand and her mother pulled her from the car and started CPR as she had seen it on TV. Until a passerby came and helped her and help came. Well, she ended up in the ICU and I was the nurse that admitted her. And she was on a ventilator, heavily sedated. She had four children, no husband. She had four children and her kids and her mother were there daily. But after like three days, she wasn't waking up. And the doctors had to tell them that she was brain dead. She had no brain activity. Mm-hmm. And... It was devastating. That's when the fighting in her family started. Two of her children wanted to take her off life support. Two of them accused the others of trying to kill her. It was just like a war zone in there. And when you don't have a healthcare agent, someone, a power of attorney document signed and sealed and delivered that someone can actually speak on your behalf if you're unable to do so, it falls to your next of kin. Well, the next of kin, if they're siblings, they all have to agree. They all have to be in agreement for decisions to move forward. So this woman was kept on life support for six and a half weeks before she just, she went into full cardiac arrest. I happened to be there that day and they tried to save her for over an hour. Through that whole thing, these kids fought and I would have to chase them out of the room. I was her primary nurse. So that meant whenever I worked, I worked with her and it was so depressing. Her mother would sit in the room every day with her just crying, like, I have destroyed this family. And I said, you did what anyone would do. She was 62 and healthy and active. You did the right thing. But that family, I am sure today is still as fractured as they were at that time, 25 years ago. It's It was so devastating to me. And that's when I became such an advocate for healthcare agents, getting your power of attorney documents in place so that you have someone that knows your wishes and can speak on your behalf. So you don't end up on a ventilator, brain dead, being kept alive. So as a coach, what's the problem that you're trying to solve for people? I'm trying to solve their fear of talking about end of life. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't like to talk about end of life because- it's so foreign in our culture. You know, people used to die at home and it was a community event. They would die. The neighbors, the women would come in, they would bring casseroles, they would help the family. And when the person died, they were laid out in the parlor or living area and people would come and pay their respects. So it wasn't a foreign thing. Families were together during the dying process and it was just a natural part of life. And that all changed I think with the civil war, there were so many bodies they couldn't keep up. And that's when the undertaker came to be, but especially with modern medicine, when modern medicine really came to be, that's when we changed from being a society that embraced death together to one that tried to put off death forever. You know, we have so many things that can save us that we don't want to die. I don't want to die. I mean, let's right. face it. I don't want to die, but I want to have a good plan when my time comes. I'm hoping I live to be a ripe old age, slide into the <laughs> grave, you know, <laughs> but um, that's not always the case. So what are some prompts that can help us open the subject of an end of life plan, either with ourselves or with a loved one? Right now, we are in a ripe time to start these conversations. With COVID going on, we don't know 
what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm going to give you an example because I've had to have this conversation with my mother. She does not like to talk about death. My dad died 12 years ago. She didn't want to talk about it then. She didn't want to prepare for it. She has all of her documents in order. But now's a great time with COVID has probably touched all of our lives now. Earlier on, people were telling me, well, I don't even know anyone that's had it. It's hard now to know, not know someone that's had COVID. So just saying, gosh, Susie's mom was diagnosed with COVID and died. And I want to start, you know, I'm concerned if this happens to you, what would you want? Or, you know, if any movie star dies, that's a good good conversation starter. Or if someone close to the family dies, that's always a good, you know, Uncle John died. You know, I want to know what your feelings are about this mom and dad. What would you want if you ended up with cancer like Uncle John? And would what, how would you want to go through that journey? So there's easy prompts. It's just having the courage to say them. And it, it takes courage because this is an emotional topic. People yeah. get very emotional. For people who are dying, what is their typical attitude toward death? Are they scared, hopeful, regretful? What, how are they feeling? Most people that are near death, they know they're dying and they want to talk about it. I think that most often people are regretful, regretful for the things they didn't do in life. And you know, I think that's why the life review process is so powerful because there's something called a life review where you're just asking questions and having them tell stories about their life. And it is so powerful because it shows that their life had meaning. And I think that's what people want to know at the end of their life, that their life had meaning and that they made a difference in some way. But I remember with patients talking about their regrets, but my dad when he was dying, I lived in Seattle, my family's in California, and my dad was a stoic Vermonter. He, he, we talked every day, we'd check in, how's the weather? How are the kids? What's the price of gas? Okay, I'll talk, call you tomorrow. You know? <laughs> and, uh, but I had written him a letter about, because my dad was not a touchy-feely person, but I had written him a letter about what he meant to me and memories from my childhood and how I felt about him and the impact he'd had on my life. Well, he called me. I was actually driving over to my cousins to leave because I have a cousin that lives in Seattle to leave our little kittens with her because we were going down to visit my parents. My dad was really going downhill, but he called me and I thought it would be the normal three questions and then on to the next day. But he started talking about his life and talking about the regrets, he wished he had been more adventurous. He wished he had been all these things and he wished he had taken more chances. And my dad was adventurous. He got in a car and drove across from Vermont to California and settled in California. I said, dad, that was hugely adventurous. So, you know, we talked for over an hour that day, just about life experiences with him and, and with us as a family. And I think it gave him peace of mind. And the fact that you had the wherewithal to stop what you were doing, right. And take that call. And, you know, because it could have been a routine call, right. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the fact that you were attuned to what he was doing, because, you know, for someone of, of that generation, and my father was the same, you know, kind of the silent generation, you know, when they open up like that, it's a time to just park it. Right. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> oh, like, just listen and, and engage. Yeah. No, I am so you. grateful that I had that conversation because my siblings did not, they could never, ask him those questions. And when he started opening up, I just kept asking questions. And, uh, but they didn't know how, because we were not a family that talked about death. We didn't talk about end of life. As I said, my mom still is like pulling teeth to get her to talk about this subject, but it was something I will cherish the rest of my life. But I was also a hospice volunteer in my life, hospice nurse and hospice volunteer. And I remember another gentleman it took me going every week for a month for him to finally start opening up a little. And then he started sharing with me stories about World War II. And he had been a soldier in World War II. And this man had become the CEO of a pretty big company here in the Pacific Northwest. And he shared his fear 
that he would not enter the heavenly realm because of the things that he had to do during World War II and that he had to kill people. I thought this man had carried that burden. He had never shared it. And I kept encouraging him to tell his wife and children these stories. And it took him another three or four weeks to be able to open up to his wife and family. His wife said, he's never talked about this in our 50 plus years of marriage, but it was freeing for him and the whole family. They got to hear stories, but he got to work through that fear that he had done bad things. I mean, he was a religious man, not overly religious, I don't think, but he still believed in heaven and hell. And he was so concerned about what he had done during that time of his life. So these conversations are powerful. How are the regrets of women different from men? I think they're similar. Women tend to regret, especially if they've never had children. That was the one thing that I, patients that I took care of that never had had children, women that had never had children. And that was a regret at the end of their life. It was funny that 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 was the thing that came up or that they regretted that maybe they weren't a good enough mother or didn't do enough for their children. So usually there's more focused around kids and family. And for men, what did they tend to focus on? They focused on some on family that they maybe weren't good enough provider things, but I think it was more things that they didn't do. They didn't take the chance to do, or they didn't take the time or they worked too much and weren't around enough for their families. After, after someone passes on, what does a healthy grieving process look like? Healthy grieving is to talk and share your feelings and it's okay to cry. I have a friend whose husband died at age 48 of a cerebral aneurysm. And I remember she said to me, we were walking into a practice with our kids. Our two sons were friends and walking in, she got all teary and she's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said, why would you be sorry? That's so healing. Cry, share your emotions. You've just lost your life partner. And um, I said, keep crying, keep sharing. We want to hear about your stories. I think by sharing stories and sharing life experiences that you had with that person, it helps you to grieve in a healing way. And I think that's why people that prepare and have these conversations well before and have had the interaction with family, they can grieve more fully in a healing manner. My mom could not share her grief with us, with her children, because she didn't want to be a burden. And she's more from that. You keep your feelings inside generation. And I used to say, mom, gosh, when I feel sad, I pick up the phone and call one of my siblings and we laugh and we cry. And then we hang up and we're feeling better because no one loved dad. Like we, the five of us, I have four, three siblings, there's four of us, but I said, you loved him in a different way. So share that with us so we can be part of this journey with you. But she really struggled with that part of it. But I think that by sharing your grief with others, it is a healing therapeutic time. How do you think people need to see death? Our experience with death, let's face it, it's ER on TV or Grey's Anatomy, or it's usually traumatic and where most people don't experience the peacefulness that death can bring. You know, I think that we need to stop seeing it as a negative and just see it as the natural journey of life. It is the natural progression of life. And it can be peaceful and it can be beautiful. You know, we get to write our own scripts, really. And so by talking about it and we get to rewrite and edit all the way through to the end of our journey. And it might not turn out that way. There might be an event where we do have to be in the hospital. But the more we plan, the more we can write our end of life journey. And I think that if people knew that and really realized that, hey, the sooner we start and the sooner we start talking about it, the better it will be, the more peaceful it will be. And for not just the person dying, but the entire family. Is there any research around having a plan and somehow that prolonging one's life or is there, is there anything like that? You know, I don't know if there is around having a plan, but I do know with hospice, patients that are on hospice and 
go on to the hospice program earlier. More often than not, they will live longer than people with their same diagnosis and prognosis. So I think that because they are talking about end of life, they're talking about comfort measures, they are talking about the whole family, they talk about bereavement, they encourage families to do these life reviews to talk about end of life. So studies through hospice have found that patients can live longer than those that are not on hospice or that go on to hospice late in their diagnosis. And there's something called the conversation project too, I'm going to throw this in. And they've done a lot of studies you know, like I think it's 90% of the elderly would like to have conversations with their family members, yet they don't because they're afraid of burdening or upsetting their families. Mm. And the family members would like to have conversations, but they're afraid of burdening or upsetting their elderly family members. And so the conversations don't happen. So you mentioned life reviews just a moment ago. Uh, what are maybe a couple of questions in that life review? It can be just something as simple. Tell me about your childhood. Start with childhood. Start asking questions. What were your parents like? Who were your friends when you were a child? And start there and then work, just work through their life. It doesn't have to be in one sitting. As I told you with that one gentleman, it was over the course of a couple months, but just start asking questions. I always like to start with their early life because oftentimes people, especially if they have any memory issues as they age, we tend to remember long-term memory and not short-term memory. So talking about their early life, they recall that and they can share events and feelings. And then as time goes on and working through, you know, young adult, what was it like? You know, why did you decide to marry your wife or your husband or what mm-hmm. attracted you to them? And, and tell me what it was like being a father or a mother and just keep working through. A lot comes up when you ask the questions and then sit back and listen and give people the opportunity to share. You've spent your entire career around death and dying. It would be very easy for someone like you to become rather jaded, right? Mm-hmm. How did you develop such a, such a positive and hopeful outlook? It's funny. I had a social worker ask me that when I was working as a bone marrow transplant nurse in Boston. And she said, how can you always be so positive? And I think early on, you know, I told you I was terrified to work with people that died. And I thought, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this. But I realized it was a beautiful, peaceful journey for so many people. And I realized that when they came into my life, I knew they were going to be there for a a short period of time, because when you have a cancer diagnosis, and back in those days, they kept coming into the hospital for their chemo It was before we had chemo clinics. And if they were long term, and maybe they'd go to their physician's office for chemotherapy. But most of the time they came in. So we developed these relationships with the the patients and families. But I knew they were there, they would either get better and go on their way, or they would be there for the final journey of their life. And I thought, wow, this is such an honor and a privilege to walk this journey with them. And that I knew they were going to be there for a finite time in my life. So I saw it as a real gift to be able to walk that journey with them. For someone who's going through uh, a chronic illness or something that's perhaps that has a negative you know, prognosis, how important is attitude to perhaps prolonging their life? Oh, I think attitude is amazing, a positive attitude or a hopeful, hopeful attitude really do help. Sometimes they don't prolong life, but a hopeful attitude makes the journey easier. I don't know if they all, it always prolongs life because I've seen people without hopeful attitudes and boy, they ended up beating the odds of anything now, but, and someone with a very hopeful attitude that doesn't, but I think it just makes the journey different. I'm a big person for mindset and our mindset is how we handle these difficult journeys. So it might not be that it prolongs life, but it makes the journey more manageable. Are there any cultures that we can learn from that have a more hopeful perspective on death? I look and to our neighbors to the South, I think the Mexicans, sure they mourn and they struggle with death like we do, but they celebrate life Mm -hmm. and they celebrate death. You know, I can never say it right. Um, I, my 
boys that are fluent in Spanish always correct me, but you know, the day of the dead, that's yeah. a day of celebration for their ancestors and those that have passed. And I think it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. I think then there's another country and now it's been, as you asked me that, the name's escaping me. They believe that speaking about death five times a day will bring us on a journey to a good death or a peaceful death. I just love that. You're on track for a, a good one yourself then. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I talk about death a lot. <laughs> all, all, all the time. <laughs> so why is it important for us to prepare for death? Like I was saying earlier, that we get to write our script And part of that script for the end of life should be, it's important to prepare because we get to leave our legacy behind and to leave the legacy of talking about death, to take away the fear from your family and leave that legacy that this is a normal part of life. It's the inevitable part of life. We are going to die. That is the one certain, even more so than taxes, because we actually don't have to pay our taxes, but we will die with 100% certainty. But I think legacy, you know, saying what you want to say to those that you want to say it, writing those letters, telling those stories, sharing memories, That's what a good plan does. It allows you to do the things that you want to do. When you plan, you know, you get to plan your bucket list too. That's part of an end of life plan. What do you want to do before you die? Put, make your your checklist and start checking off your bucket list. So there's so many positives about planning, but we also get to plan. Do we want to die in the ICU on a ventilator or do we want to die at home, surrounded by those that matter most to us in an environment of comfort, choosing the music that we want to listen to. You know, I, I've already told my boys uh, what I do and don't want to listen to if anything happens to me. And uh, I've learned that none of them want country music played if they're in a coma or anything, or they're, you know, in and out of consciousness. They're like, no country music, even though uh, it's not that bad, but we don't want it played at the end of our life. And they're in their 20s. And we've had these conversations. And you can make, I mean, we laughed about it a lot, but you get to make those choices. Now, will it always be exactly as you plan? No, because life isn't always like that, but you have much more control. And like I said, there is the chance that one might wish to die at home, but die in a hospital instead or a care facility. But there's more likeliness of us dying at home if that's what we choose and our families being prepared. I could talk about caregiving. That's another aspect, but you know, those are all things if you've prepared for it, because being a caregiver to someone that's ill can be quite challenging, but with a good plan, good financial plan, having prepared for it, it makes it a lot easier when those times come. What are some of the biggest mistakes that families make when faced with a medical crisis like COVID, for example, or even an unexpected death? I think that the biggest mistake is dealing strictly from emotion, not taking the time to take a deep breath and say, even if you've never talked about it, just to take a deep breath and say, okay, let's think. There's, there's always a moment to think about what should be done. And it's hard to take the emotion out of it. And it's easier when you've talked about it. But I think dealing strictly from emotion. May I give you an example of a recent event? My mom's good friend who I've known, I've grown up with, I'd grown up with his family and she was in her 80s. She died over the summer, not of COVID, but she had had chronic illnesses that kept getting worse. And she had an event, her husband called the paramedics, they took her to the hospital, they did allow her husband and oldest daughter into the hospital. And my mom's friend had said, I never want to be put on any machines, or I don't want to be kept alive, all in general terms, you know, and she did have her husband was her next of kin. Well, the doctors told them, she won't make it through the night if we don't put her on life support. Well, she had always said she didn't want to ever be on machines. And she was 82 and had lived a great life. But her husband's like, no, she didn't want that. And her daughter's like, yes, yes, we have to do it. We have to do it. I mean, her, her, her daughter came from pure emotion and they put her on a ventilator. And one thing led to another, not just being on the ventilator, but over the next couple of days, her kidneys started failing. So then they were talking about having to put her on dialysis. Her heart, which she had a lot of heart issues, was 
failing. Uh, she had, you know, they were just chasing yeah. every problem and yeah. kept compounding. And finally, her husband, who would sit in the parking lot every day so he could go in for his short little visit with her, he finally told his family, no, enough, we can't do this anymore. So after being on a ventilator and going down this vicious cycle of system failure, they took her off the ventilator and wanted to get her home. She died within an hour of getting off the ventilator at the hospital. Wow. And I, you know, my, I was sad because it could have been different. Instead of being virtually alone in a hospital during the era of COVID, she could have been in her comfortable surroundings at home with mm. her family there, loving on her with her dog on her bed. It could have been so different and it wasn't, but it was it was an example of emotions taking over instead of saying, okay, we do have a few minutes. We do have time to make a rational decision. And it's hard to make those rational decisions in those moments. With COVID being so pervasive right now, a lot of people are going through the illness alone, or they're even dying alone, what kind of advice would you give to their families or what kind of wor words of comfort or what would you say to, to families that are going through that or even individuals that, that, that are going through that? You know, I think that's been one of the hardest things that I've had to deal with emotionally myself yeah. is just watching and hearing about people dying alone in the hospital. And I think that as awful as it is, I think that the comfort is from those healthcare workers that are taking care of them. They have really been the angels through wow. all of this to take comfort that those people that are there with them are doing the best they can to support and comfort them. That's a devastation that I just can't imagine. My uncle died, not of COVID, but and my cousin, he died in June, quite suddenly, he had a fall, broke his hip and ended up hospitalized. His wife saw him as the ambulance took him to the hospital, but she wasn't allowed to be there. And my cousin that lives here near me, I called her the day he had surgery, and she was crying and saying, he's not doing well, he's not doing well. And I said, do you need to get on a plane? And she's like, what would I do? I can't even get into the hospital to see him. And she was just really having a hard time. And I said, you hang up with me, you call the hospital and you talk to the charge nurse and ask her to put the phone to his ear. Because even if he's not responding, I know they hear you. And I said, have her put the phone to your father's ear so you can talk to him and say goodbye. I said, hang up right now. So she hung up and she called and he was alert and the nurse FaceTimed and she got to see him and talk to him wow. as she called her stepmother and um, said, you call this nurse, she will get you on and call her right now. So they were able to at least have that FaceTime. That's what those nurses are doing. That's what those ER doctors are doing. That's what the house cleaning staff is doing. Mm -hmm. I heard a man speak who was not expected to live. He was on a ventilator, but every day the house cleaner came in and she would talk to him and tell him not to give up and that words of encouragement. Wow. And he said, that's what got him through. And he actually survived, but all he could remember, he, he said he just in his sedated state, he waited for her to come every day to give him those words of encouragement. And that's what he hung on to, to survive this. So I think that that's the only comfort I can give people if they can't be with their loved ones is that those people there are angels taking care of them. We were talking about this earlier that one of one of the things I think that gets overlooked in all of this in the negative press of, of the cases and the deaths and everything like that is that this time has brought out a lot of goodness in people. Oh. And, and and what you just described I think is an is a superb example of that. Perfect strangers, the, you know, the person who cleans the room, the nurses, you know, the doctors, those who are there are giving comfort, are acting as surrogate family, you know, for people who are there suffering. Yes. Oh, that's I heard beautiful. of an ER doctor that before he put had to put anyone on a ventilator, called it's called intubating them, putting the breathing tube down, he would make them call their families in case that was the last time they ever got to speak to them. I mean, that's wow. going above and beyond because when you're in that moment of needing to make this uh, decision and put that breathing tube in to take the moment to have them call and say goodbye, if you will. I mean, I just, I get teary every time I think of that. It's amazing. It really, it really does restore your faith in humanity. Mm -hmm. So because death is unpredictable, at what age do you think it's appropriate to start thinking about end of life planning? Well, 
I think that when your children turn 18, they should start thinking about it. But I think that it's never too early because once, once our kids are 18, we are no longer, I mean, we might even have a hard time getting medical information about them because of HIPAA laws. They are now an adult. So I think having these conversations to say, you know, you are now an adult and your mom and I are both next of kin. So we need to make decisions, especially as they head off to college, things like that. If anything were to happen to you, we need someone that can legally speak for you because it might not be that your mother or I could, or that we might have differing opin- of opinions. That's what I told my boys. You know, I think your father and I would be on the same page, but at a time of trauma, and usually if it's a young person, it would be a traumatic incident mm-hmm. that would cause them to not be able to speak on their own behalf. But I said that I want you to have one of us that can speak, legally speak for you. So I think that it's important to start talking to them at a younger age, at young adults, and then for us to start planning all along, because people don't realize that it costs money to die. It costs a lot of money to die, actually. Um, So the sooner you can start getting these plans in place, you know, plan for insurance to cover, you know, burial expenses, if you were to die young. Um, I think that my goal is by having this planning that we'll never see GoFundMes for funeral expenses, that people will put the proper um, financial plans in place. And you don't have to have a lot, but when you start planning early, it is a blessing to your family because Mm -hmm. end of life can be a financial burden on families Mm -hmm. because of the expense. People don't realize it costs money to get bodies out of morgues. That's where these GoFundMes come in because it's the only way sometimes people can get the bodies out of the morgue to get to the funeral home to continue on with what they need to do. Does insurance cover any aspect of this, of the planning there process? Are, there are burial insurances. I know there are insurance plans that can be dedicated to end-of-life expenses. How do you define getting our affairs in order? What are all the things that we need to consider and and what needs to be on that checklist? Having your your estate plans in order, having insurance policies to cover those final expenses, having things in order for your family, meaning do they know how to pay your bills? Do you have your financial power of attorney document signed? Do you have your medical power of attorney document signed? Do you have young kids? Do you have guardianship for your children? That's getting your affairs in order because we don't expect to die when our children are young, but it could happen. Then besides the financial having it all listed out. I have a friend that runs, uh, she and her husband started a company, Life Goes On Roadmap. It tells you how to contact people, where all your financial documents are stored, the phone numbers of everyone, how to shut off the water and gas for your home if anything happens. It's like every nitty gritty of life that you would need to know about. So I had done that, her program, and I took it. We had a family meeting. I made my boys when they were home from college and my husband, I'm like, okay, this is where everything is, but it has every password because that's another thing. How do you get into accounts if you don't have the password? So all of that's getting your affairs in order, but having it and then updating it. I tell everyone to review their plans yearly, make it their birthday gift to themselves sometime in their birthday month to sit down and go over what their end of life wishes are. What would I want? What does living well mean to me? What's a good day now? to me today, because it's going to change as we age. So are all your passwords up to date? Are all your financial documents still in the same place? Um, Just to make sure that everything's in order, if anything happened to you, to make it easier for your family. And then to write letters to those people that mean something to you, to tell people how you feel, to share your family stories. That's awesome. That's getting your affairs in order. What's the value of having someone like you coach them through the planning process? I think that the value is helping take away the fear, the unknown. My big passion is getting families talking because it's great if we have all of our affairs in order, but if no one knows what they are, if no one knows what our wishes. So the value is to have a structure to sit down, go through all of this. We go through all of documentation and help decide what they would want and talk them through that. And then, but the whole purpose is to bring the family together. And that's what I love to do is to go in with families and help facilitate the conversation and 
get that meaningful conversation going because there could be conflict during these conversations too. Not every family member agrees and they don't have to agree with their loved one's wishes, but the whole purpose is to get them to honor and respect those wishes. So that is the value of having someone like me come in or a, a end of life planning coach, or even just to help get the end of life planning documents in order, the advanced directives, powers of attorney documents, things like that. So I want to do something a little bit different. I want to do something called a speed round. And I want, I want to, I want to, I'm going to say a word and you tell me the, the first word that comes to mind. So the first word is goals. Aspiration. Time. Valuable. Life. Journey. Grief. Healing. Healing. Resilience. Hopeful. Regret. Unnecessary. Death. Inevitable. Preparation. Roadmap. Relationships. Fulfilling. Family. I have two words that are coming to mind. Unconditional and challenging. (laughs) I can see that. I can see that. And the last word is hope. Hope. Doesn't that say it all? (laughs) Maybe faith. I think it was a regret. You said, you said unnecessary. 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 Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Why, Why did you, why did you say that? Just out of curiosity. Even though of course I have regrets, I think they're unnecessary. You know, we can't look back. We can never go back. So we should just live in the present and look forward because there's nothing we can do about what's happened in the past. So to regret it is just a waste of our time and energy. Now we can learn from it and then it shouldn't be a regret because it's something that's taught us something to move forward. I always think that everything that happens in our life is the journey to where we're supposed to go. So that really, if even if it's something that didn't work out or something that, you know, we wish hadn't happened, it can't be a regret because it's getting us to where we're, we're supposed to be. That's my opinion. That's beautiful. Thank you. So I want to ask you just some general advice and lessons learned questions. If you could share one secret of your success, what would that be? Tenacity. Resiliency. I think that was, was that one of the words you asked? But um, I think that just not giving up, well, especially now that I've entered this phase, who wants to talk about death? So being tenacious about it. So I think tenacity and just not looking, as I said about regrets, not looking at mistakes as failures, but as stepping stones to learning. What's the greatest lesson you've learned either in life or in business? To be curious, to ask questions. And then the most important is to listen to the answers and what people are saying. People will tell you the answers. We just have to listen for them sometimes. But I think curiosity is a lesson I've learned. Be curious and open-minded. That's a great lesson. If you could offer one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Be hopeful. We live, despite what's going on now, in such an amazing world. Just to have faith and believe in, in each other, despite our differences. What do you want most for your life? What I want most for my life? is to just share in the joy and sorrows of others and to raise good kids, which my kids, my sons are all in their early 20s. And, you know, to raise good, moral, decent human beings to carry on and to to share life experiences with others. I think you're well on your way. So at this point, I just want to open it up for you. Are there any final thoughts that you want to share with us? Is there anything I haven't asked you that, <laughs> that no, you, you feel like? A lot. I think um, <laughs> one of the final thoughts is if I could just encourage anyone listening to go out, get that power of attorney document, at the very least, figure out who you would want to make your healthcare decisions for you. I think that's the first and most important step. If anything should happen to you and you were, would be unable to speak for yourself, have that person that you trust to make the right decision. Even if it's something you haven't talked about, you know, they'll make the right decision for you because you trust them and get that documentation done because we don't know that tomorrow or later today, we're not going to step out and have that traumatic accident 
where we won't be able to speak for ourselves. It's been my plea for 30 years, please get those documents done. And it starts with writing your name on it. (laughs) And there's many ways to get those. I'm part of a program here honoring choices Pacific Northwest, but there's plenty of documentation out there. You don't have to just go through attorneys, but I think that power of attorney document signed and notarized and witnessed and whatever you need in your state. Each state is different. It's the most powerful document you can have for your end of life. Maureen, this has been a a marvelous conversation. You are a person who's full of joy, who's full of hope, and who's been able to transform something that is such a negative aspect of life, or at least that's the way our society sees it, and turn it into something that's hopeful. And, and something that we can even, in some ways, look forward to uh, with courage and with grace. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Where can people find you online and connect with you and connect with your resources? Well, probably the easiest to remember is I have a free offering, seven prompts to speaking of dying, scare you to death, and seven prompts to get the conversation started anywhere from your parents to siblings to your doctor, how to talk to your doctor. And uh, they can go to start the talk now.com and download that and also there's a little button there to uh, have a chat so i'd love for anyone that wants to schedule a free conversation to just hit that let's chat button and schedule a time and i also they can go to my website to get other information which is radiantmorning.com and morning has a u in it as the grief morning so maureen thank you so much this it's been such a pleasure to talk with you today. Oh, Mark, thank you for having me.